Welcome back to round seven of the Dubai Rapid Tournament. I want to start off this video by apologizing. In the last one, I said that this video would feature a Stafford Gambit. I got confused. That's going to be seen in the next video, so stay tuned for that. Um, but this game will feature another favorite opening of mine, a London opening, and we're going to see uh, how it goes for me. So to set the stage, I am playing the lowest rated player with four and a half out of six points. Coming into this round, I had four out of six points. I was the highest rated player uh, with that score. So the way that Swiss pairings work, I do end up playing a player well below my rating. But as we're gonna see in this game, my opponent was definitely underrated and it was not an easy game by any means. So I start off with my bread and butter opening, London system, and uh, my opponent just copies me, plays bishop f5. And normally I am um, happy going into this line because usually what happens here is black plays knight f6, I go for c4 and the very quick queen b3, knight c3, target b7, have some nice kind of positional play on the queen side. Um, however, my opponent was able to essentially stop me from playing this plan by including the very early bishop to d6. And I'll admit this is not a move I encounter so often, but it's a move I should definitely be ready for because uh, it turns the position into a much more symmetrical battle and it becomes harder for white to play for much of an advantage. So of course I have to react to the bishop attacking my bishop. I decide to move back and after knight f6, uh, the plan of c4, it's a little bit slow here. If I do choose to play c4, then black can actually very simply castle. And if this, there's lines where black doesn't need to defend, for example, knight c6. And if I take the pawn, there's knight b4. And black is already winning here. So I didn't want to risk entering those lines. And I decided to play a bit more positionally and went for bishop to d3, just kind of keeping things very symmetrical. Pulling castles, I take, takes. And here we see the first sort of imbalance in the position. The double pawns aren't necessarily weak for black because there is g6 at black's disposal. But I was happy to get a position uh, going into middle game where there would be some long-term imbalance and more room to play for a win. So I went ahead, I castle, pawn c6, and I play pawn c4, trying to create more imbalances in the pawn structure. Opponent plays knight e4, I take, take, and queen b3. So I was actually feeling quite good at this point because black has an isolated d pawn, f pawn is undefended, d pawn's undefended. There's a lot of weaknesses in black's position and um, black is still a bit underdeveloped on the queen side. Now my opponent here took on g3. I took back and then played pawn to b6, defending the b pawn. I go ahead, play knight to c3. And um, here comes kind of the first critical moment of the game where after my opponent took back, I ended up playing the wrong recapture here. I'm pretty sure I played my move relatively quickly, thinking it was the best move. But I want to pose this moment to the viewer. This is white to move. Obviously, there's two options. Queen takes c3 and pawn takes c3. The question is, which move to play and why. And feel free to pause the video, take some time to think. Um, this is a more kind of positional, intuitive decision. So I will go ahead and say the correct move is queen takes c3. Move I played was pawn takes c3. We'll come back to that. The reason why queen takes c3 is much better is because it's uh, a bit more prophylactic in nature. I'm preventing the knight from developing to c6. I'm also controlling the c-file very quickly with the idea of rook c1 next. And if we look at a natural line, let's imagine knight d7, rook c1, I'm already in position to play queen c7 and start kind of crashing through on the queen side. If my opponent tries to neutralize the file with rook c8, I can very nicely put the queen on a3, target another weakness in the position, uh, this pawn on a7. And uh, it's a little bit tricky for Vak to play because the queen is a bit tied down to defending the rook. If a move like a5 is played, I can move back, hitting the pawn. It actually looks like black is losing a pawn in this position. 
because there's, there's no great way to keep d5 and b6 well defended. For example, if knight to f6, I can take then win the b6 pawn. And I know that's kind of a long sort of specific line, but the point is to give kind of a general idea of how white can uh, capitalize on the weaknesses in black's position after playing queen takes c3. Um, now, what I did in the game was pawn takes c3, and the reason why this isn't as good is because I give up the the, the most powerful like potential weapon in the position, the, the c file, even though I, I am planning to play c4 and get two center pawns against zero center pawns, I am giving black a bit easier play and easier development. Uh, here my opponent plays knight c6, which turns out to be a really nice move because now knight a5 is a substantial positional threat to start targeting the c4 square. So I go ahead, play c4 immediately. And at first I know this looks like it loses a pawn to knight a5, but my plan was to play queen c2 and if knight takes c4, I would take back and still have good chances to uh, play for an advantage here, given that d6 is weak. And uh, there's potential on the king's side to attack. So my opponent didn't play knight a5, instead took on c4. And here the game became just very positional, and it was a matter of both of us trying to find the optimal setup for our pieces. Opponent plays rook c8, aligning with my queen. I play queen b5. Sneakily hitting the pawn, opponent defends it. I play rook c1, queen d6, rook d1. A lot of these moves very natural. And now here after knight to b4, uh, nice move from my opponent. Now there's tension between the rooks. Have to be somewhat concerned about a2 falling. There's also the idea of knight d5, which is just a very nice central square for the knight. So I go ahead, I save my a pawn with pawn a3. Opponent plays knight to d5. And after queen a6, knight c3. I realize that I'm not really much better here at all. Like even though I have the center pawns, it's a very stable structure. Black just also has a really nice setup. And here I have to be a little bit uh, cognizant of the tactical ideas for black. If I'm not careful and play a move like rook d2, then all of a sudden knight e2, and I would be losing uh, rook for knight after takes and takes. So um, I had to put the rook back on e1. Now we should know here that the same tactic doesn't work uh, because my queen defends e2. If my queen were, for example, let's imagine like here, here, uh, if it weren't covering e2, then knight e2 would again win the exchange. But uh, thankfully my queen was covering the square and after rook e1, my opponent played rook to c7, defending the pawn, also preparing the double up. And uh, so far, like during this game, I realize my opponent is not actually uh, a 1500 strength. And if this were something like guess elo, I would guess probably around 2000. Now, I did look up my opponent after the game, um, and he's rated, I think, around 1900, 2000, just classical fide. So um, definitely a, a very capable player and uh, goes to show in chess that you sometimes you can't just play against the opponent's rating. You just have to play the board and make the best moves possible. So here I play knight e5, centralizing my knight. Opponent doubles up rooks on the c-file and I play king h2, just trying to get out the way of potential knight checks. If I wasn't careful and play some dumb move like f3, then knight e2 would really hurt me because there's now a battery and I'd be losing some material. So king h2 I thought was just a safer place for the king. Uh, but here my opponent plays f6, chases away my knight, and plays h5. I was starting to feel the pressure given that the knight is very, very stable on c3. And all of a sudden there's potential for h4 and rook swinging over. And the queen is also aligned with my king. Meanwhile, my queen is just kind of sitting on the sidelines, watching all the action from afar, but not really participating in the game. So here I just tried to make the best of the situation, played knight to f4, targeting the now undefended g6 pawn. My opponent defended, uh, which after king g7, it does block rook h7, but it opens up rook h8. So there's still some concern for me on the h-file. I go ahead, play rook c2. And now king h6, 
So slightly mysterious move, but maybe just getting away of the potential knight check on e6. I play rook c1, and after g5, knight e2, this is where most of the pieces start coming off of the board. Now, I, I wanted to keep tension in the position, but of course, if I'm not careful and don't go for trades, this move h4 is coming. And uh, for example, if I play a move like knight d3, h4, and this could be really, really scary with the pawn pinned, knight e4 in the horizon. And uh, I thought knight e2, it's, it's just a move to try and survive. And this does lead to the trade of the knights and also all of the rooks after it takes, 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 we now reach a uh, pretty much completely equal queen pawn ending where, yeah, the structure is still imbalanced, but I thought that realistically, it's going to be really tough winning this position. Uh, I do have one pass pawn on d4, but black has a queen side majority, can very easily create a pass pawn on the queen side. Not to mention there's still some attacking potential with h4 for black. And uh, there's cases where my king will, uh, will have less shelter if we do see the trade of pawns. So here I just had to keep fighting and, and try and keep playing the best moves as I could. So my opponent went ahead and played h4, uh, just going for some more trades. I played queen d3. We traded on g3. And here my opponent played f4. So clearly going for just total simplification. If all the pawns come off the board, then my chances to win will be pretty much zero. So um, I was looking for ways to keep some tension in the position. And I decided to take once on f4. And after takes back, I played e4. Now, this does give black the opportunity to discover check and trade off uh, another pawn. I thought if this did happen, I would move back. And if takes, I could start harassing the king, um, win the pawn with check. But uh, if we entered this line, I, I think it would be most likely just a draw. One of us is going to start perpetuating the other. Um, instead, my opponent played the move king to g5, uh, keeping the option open of pawn f3. And if we notice, the king is very difficult to check from the g5 square. Uh, I do have queen b5 check, but then black could just move back and I don't really make any progress. So here I actually realized I have a small trick in the position is to start with a move d5, um, pushing my only pass pawn. And I'm still inviting the potential discover check along the diagonal. But it turns out if black plays f3, my opponent did play this in the game, uh, this is actually a, a crucial mistake because it allows me to block the check with my d pawn and suddenly just seize initiative, hit the queen. This pawn on f3 uh, just doesn't scare me so much. The queen has one check, queen h7. This is what happened in the game. I will mention that if black didn't play f3 and just simply blockaded the d pawn, it would have been really, really hard to make progress. But um, we went for this line, f3, d6, queen h7. I move my king back to g1. And here I was beginning to breathe a sigh of relief, especially after my opponent's next move, pawn takes g2. Now, of course, my opponent is threatening a nasty move, queen h1. I don't have time for d7, but I do have time to force a trade of queens with the move queen g3, forcing the king to the h-file. And this is what happened, king h6, queen h4. And here my opponent resigned. It was a very abrupt turn of events, given the position went from very likely drawing to just completely winning for me in the span of a couple of moves. Um, but I was very fortunate to uh, come away from this game with a win. Uh, protecting my rating, even a draw in this game, would have uh, done some damage to my rating, given my opponent was over 800 points low rated than me. So yeah, the crucial moment was this position. Uh, queen d6 turns out to be the only move for black to hold equality, because d6 is a very big threat. 
And I've noticed this uh, sometimes at uh, especially amateur level play, when a player delivers discover check, it's sometimes easy to overlook the fact that uh, it's not the piece moving that's doing the checking, it's a piece being unleashed. So it's possible my opponent just missed my chance to play d6, and I was very fortunate that uh, it turned into a winning position. So just to show here if my opponent uh, blockaded the pawn, I would happily take go up a pawn, queen d5 coming, and uh, it still takes some work to convert, but this would still be winning for white. Um, so that's about it for game seven. Played the London, could have got advantage out of the kind of mid to late middle game. Uh, opponent played really, really well to not only neutralize my, my play, but outplay me at some point. I was probably worse at some point in this game. And uh, okay, I walked away with a win. This put me at five and a half out of seven in the standings with two more games to go. So this time, I'm not lying. Next game will feature a Stafford Gambit. Stay tuned. It'll be a fun one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next video.